Welcome to Metro Vancouver Close Up, your look at what municipalities and citizens are doing to build a livable region. Virtually all disposable coffee cups are made of fused layers of paper and plastic, and they don't fit well in any recycling schemes. Many end up as litter, so an annual event is drawing attention to the issue and celebrating an important team of service providers who are part of the waste management system. It's 8.30 in the morning and a lineup stretches across Victory Square in downtown Vancouver. These people have been working to collect single-use paper coffee cups and they're exchanging them for cash. This took me an hour this morning. It's a one-day event called the Coffee Cup Revolution, put on by the Binners Project, an organization dedicated to educating the public about the good work that binners do, collecting recyclable items in exchange for cash, thereby keeping them out of the landfill. Paper products like these cups, they're a nuisance, and uh, usually uh, before the, the paper cup uh, revolution starts, say five or six months you'll see them all over the streets the, the garbage cans are stuffed full of them especially around fast food uh, outlets I want to put on, and this one too here Devin. the event brings attention to the thousands upon thousands of single-use coffee cups that litter our city and clog up our landfills the problem with coffee cups is there's so much of them and they aren't being uh, readily recycled um, you see them everywhere, you see them in the alleyways, you see them in the garbage cans, um, you see them tossed away on the ground. Today with the coffee cup revolution, it's bringing awareness to, hey, coffee cups are a bit of a problem, we need to get them out of our waste stream. Each cup that's handed in today earns a payback of five cents to a maximum of twenty dollars a person. Can I have your name and your uh, signature there? It's an experiment of sorts to see what would happen if a five cent deposit were added to disposable paper cups. While the cup collection is underway, a group of experts brainstorms the idea in a roundtable discussion. I think a deposit on coffee cups would benefit uh, everybody in uh, BC for sure. I'm really big on, on the deposit and I think if you're paying four dollars for a cup of coffee, another nickel is nothing. The idea gets the general thumbs up. I think the one thing that we agreed on moving forward is that more people have to come to the table. Discussions have to include different stakeholders, like the people that are creating the coffee cups that are producing them. More than 30,000 cups are handed in in just a few hours. Organizers believe monetizing coffee cups would change the landscape. Our streets would be cleaner. Uh, you wouldn't see the city, uh, the city bins uh, completely full and like garbage around, like you wouldn't, I don't think you would see any of that. By day's end, the pockets of these residents were richer by a total of more than $1,500, and downtown Vancouver was a much cleaner place. Soil that's trucked away from construction sites often contains debris and rubble, and is not suited to dumping on agricultural land, but that's what's been happening. The Corporation of Delta has taken charge with legislation to reverse that, and Metro Vancouver will begin a process to track the movement of soil through the whole region. 95% of Metro Vancouver's agricultural land is located in six municipalities. But this precious resource is under threat by the illegal dumping of soil excavated from construction sites or fill. I looked into it and I contacted the municipalities and they said, yeah, we're having problems. It's really hard to enforce this. We don't know where the fill's coming from. The Corporation of Delta recently enacted a bylaw to deal with the problem of illegal fill dumping. There are bylaws. I understand you wanted a soil application. Yes. This is the application. Now when we issue soil deposit permits, the onus is on the property owner to maintain a log of the trucks coming and going. The bylaw officer maintains a log when he's watching the property from a distance, sees the trucks coming and going, records the license plates, and then goes in and checks the site to make sure that the license plates that he's seen go by are on the log the farmer's maintained. How many trucks did you have come in roughly today. Can I just see yep, if they match up? Yep. Okay, thank you. The penalty for not recording uh, the trucks coming on the log is $500 per truck. And it's not out of line for us to uh, issue thousands of dollars in fines if someone is trying to hide it or keep it secret how many trucks have come into the site. On a couple of occasions we've uh, issued fines in excess of $20,000.
Not only does illegal fill dumping degrade productive farmland, it can affect municipal drainage systems and stream water quality as well. Fill can also include detritus of demolition sites, which creates risky hazards for farm equipment. Metro Vancouver is creating an online database that will help track and monitor the movement of fill across the region. The project aims to help municipalities like Delta enforce their bylaws and stop illegal dumping. It's a two-year pilot project. Each municipality gives permits for uh, removing and depositing soil. And so we need to register them and find out how much fill is being moved and where it is being moved to. In order to have a robust data registry, input from all member municipalities will be essential to the pilot process. I think Metro Vancouver's pilot project is probably the missing link that we're looking for. Something that will give us the advantage of knowing where the material is coming from. Currently, uh, we don't know too much about the material until it's on its way here. There's no point in sending it out this way unless it's going to be good for farming. The registry is estimated to be up and tracking the region's fill by spring 2016. Smaller loads of clean wood from construction sites must now be composted instead of going to landfill. It's one of the Metro Vancouver policies that municipalities have supported. Green building construction techniques have also advanced, in large part due to the joint effort of industry and civic leaders. Come on in. The Centre for Interactive Research on Sustainability, or SIRS as it's known, is housed in a state-of-the-art building at the University of British Columbia. So this is our sewage treatment plan. Again, it was designed to be really prominent in the building. The SIRS building is toured frequently. So the water from here we use for landscape irrigation. Uh, we have a green roof, which we'll show you. So we irrigate that and we flush the toilets with that. Today's group is attending Building Lasting Change, the Canada Green Building Council's national convention. The City of Vancouver's Green Office. City Initiative is the subject of a well-attended workshop. We take a very strong approach in our Green City work um, that failure is actually success. It's good for us to share the challenges that we're having. Of course, we're happy to share the things that are working, um, but we find that we learn the most when we're able to dive into the pieces that we're challenged by. Five, ten years ago, there was a real, Vancouver was clearly in the lead and many, many local people and, and local people were following. But what I find really exciting is that we are now starting to learn from the surrounding municipalities as well. When there's a piece that we know is important, we really start to go, how can we help you advance that? Because we want to learn from it. The floor here, you'll notice, is this is recycled tires. The SIRS building at UBC is certified at the platinum level of the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, or LEAD, program. We don't use no fossil fuels to, to make the building work. The only building that actually has air conditioning is the lecture hall just because it's hard to cool 450 people in the same room. The City of Vancouver now requires all new developments to achieve LEED Gold certification. They also must exceed the energy performance currently required by the building code by 22%. People often think of cars and trucks when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions and their contribution to climate change. But actually, the house or condo you live in, or the tower you work in, could be a worse offender. Buildings are one of the largest contributors to, to carbon emissions in Canada. Uh, in the city of Vancouver alone, is 56% of all carbon emissions comes from buildings and homes. Uh, climate change is accelerating, we all know it. And buildings last a long, long time. So the decisions we make today, they will determine our carbon future. You can exchange a car every five years, maybe every 10 years. A building might be exchanged every 100 years, maybe even 200 years, maybe even longer, depending on the building type. So the decisions we make right now are, are key. People will say, um, we shouldn't be doing any, any, anymore, or we shouldn't do it yet, it's too hard, or too complex, it costs too much money. The evidence exists that it's not, and I think you just have to get on with it. municipalities, people, and organizations who help tell these stories. Check out the Metro Vancouver blog for more videos and articles about our great region. For Metro Vancouver Close-Up, I'm Dagmar Timmer. Coming up after the break, it's the Sustainable Region.